it's been real good to be part of High Point this weekend and a packed house today. You must not have gotten the memo that I was going to be here. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that I'm here. And in case you weren't able to be part of the conference stuff up until now, just a little bit about myself and my family. I think I got a picture of my family coming soon. Uh, that's my family. My wife, Amy, and I met when we were in seventh grade. And I knew pretty quickly that she was the one. She took a little bit of convincing, uh, but I won out pretty big in that way. And we got married right after college. And we have four kids now. Our oldest is Maddie. She's 11. And then our one son is nine. And then we have a daughter named Andy, who's six. And our youngest is Ella. She's four. And uh, we often have happy, fun, smiley times together like that, but uh, not all the time. Uh, other times, you'll just hear my wife and I chanting, these four no more. And that's kind of the motto around our house. Yeah, some husbands are nudging their wives at this moment, so you can use that one. And as Dwayne said, our, our history with the beaches goes back. I got a couple pictures, too, if you miss these. So. Yeah, this is soon after Dwayne and I met down there in the bottom corner there. That was freshman year of college with another friend of ours, a military man himself. And then, uh, and then the other picture, us with our wives soon after we got married. So we have a great friendship and love for the beaches that goes back nearly 20 years now. Uh, we're able to be in their wedding and, and they in ours and uh, had kids around the same time. They stopped a little short of us. I'm not a couple more to catch up, I think. Uh, but man, it's just so good, and I'm, I'm excited for you uh, to be part of their ministry. Duane and Daylin love you dearly, and they're, uh, you're a significant part of their hearts and their lives. They love this church. And I'll just say, not to, not to pat myself on the back at all, but we're financial supporters of Duane and Daylin and of High Point. And I, I don't say that, you know, on my credit, but just so that you know that we're deeply invested in what God is doing here and have been for 10 years now, 10 or 15 years, or as long as they've been here, I guess 10 years. And so we're excited to be here and to be with you. I know this is a, a significant time of life, you know, as most of you are not here forever, but you're here for this period of time. And this is one of those seasons you're going to look back on. And, and oftentimes in pivotal circumstances in life, we can either lean into God and find that He is all we need and He is there with us, helping to change us and bring us through those times. Or unfortunately, those pivotal circumstances in life are times when a lot of people kind of turn away from God. And I hope that High Point will be a place that will help you lean into God uh, in the midst of the challenges and the hardship as well as the joys that you're going to experience in this time of life. You'll notice that I, I had Dwayne remove the pulpit. Uh, and so if you like that, just mention how much you like that. If you don't like it, just be like, whoa, glad that McGinnis guy is gone. Let's get our pulpit back. Uh, so I just wanted to have a little more freedom and, and access. So just want to share with you a few things about what we do when the things that God asks of us don't really make any sense. Right? What do you do in those moments when God asks you to do something and it doesn't make sense and it's going to be really hard and it's going to kind of upend your life? And in a way, in a loose connection, this is a continuation of the theme we've been drawn through the missions conference. Now, if you missed Thursday and Friday, that's okay. I, I hope you'll still be able to track with today. But just by way of review, on Thursday, we talked about the fact that, that wherever you go, if your eyes are open, you'll discover that God is at work, not just here, but everywhere. God is at work. He is on the move. He is active and present no matter where you go. And some of you knew that, you know, you had homes and home churches somewhere maybe in the States and, and you knew God was working there and then you show up here in Germany and it may have been a surprise for you to discover, hey, God's at work here as well. And, and there's, there's a presence, there are a people of God. And now this weekend you've heard God's at work in Romania and in Budapest, Hungary. And, and God is at work no matter where you go. You're going to find that he is active and drawing people to himself. And he invites us to be a part of that, to go where he's leading and to join what he is doing. And I trust that you'll find the part that he wants you to play wherever you are in the story that God's writing. And then on Friday night, we looked just, just briefly at what kind of work God is doing. Right? We looked at the state of, of the world, the condition that we are in ever since the fall of mankind and the brokenness that everyone feels in our relationship with God and our relationship with each other and our relationships with the rest of creation. And we looked at the fact that Jesus came to heal all of that brokenness. And he came to reconnect us to God and to help us find that peace and forgiveness that we desperately need. And he came to reconnect us with each other 
to help us live in harmony and in love with other people. And he came even to heal the brokenness in this world around us. And he invites us to be part of his work in all three of those dimensions. And today I just I want to give kind of a final message, one that really hopefully has some teeth that will put it back on you and say, okay, well, what is it that God wants you to do? Where is he leading you? What is he asking of you? What part of his story does he want you to play a little chapter in? What's that next step that he's calling you to take? And I know some of you have looked back on those moments, and some of you are maybe in one of those moments right now, and and some of you, I can just tell you, it's coming. Well, God's going to ask something of you. He's going to ask you to take a step, and and it may not make any sense, and it may be really hard. And and I want to just hopefully give some insight today that will help you know how to deal with that. But let me just give an illustration maybe to help help you make sense. So I want you to put your hands out like this and point your, L, your, your thumbs to the floor. This is an all play, so go ahead. Everybody's involved. You put your palms to the outside, right, and your thumbs are facing down. Then I want you to take your right hand, and I want you to just bring it over top of your left hand and lock your fingers like that. Some of you are lost already. Those of you that got it, just hold it. Some of you are, you had to put your, uh, palms are out, and I want you to just take your right hand and then put it right over top of your left. And then what I want you to do is just turn it over like this. (laughs) Just uh, turn it right. (sighs) Boy, all right. Well, you can work on that later, all right? See, that is a little strange that none of you were actually able to do that. I'm not not sure what kind of people you got here, Dwayne, but sometimes... The instructions that we get, they just don't make sense, right? And they get us all twisted around and upended a little bit. And the stuff that I might ask you to do or the stuff that, that you may be asked to do by your, your superiors or your employers, sometimes the stuff you're asked to do by God is just more than you're able to understand, more than you're able to, to move towards. And I want to take a look at someone who had that experience, a man named Elijah. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah is someone who had this experience with God where he was asked to do something that made no sense, something that that was going to be really difficult. And And I want you to see, and I think maybe you can relate with his story a little bit, just to give you some context, in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 16, we're introduced to Ahab, who, who is the most wicked king that Israel ever had. And you see that at the end of chapter 16. He did more uh, wickedness than any of the kings before him. And not only that, but he married this woman, Jezebel, who was you know, dead set against God. And not only was he and his wife wicked, but then they led the nation of Israel to worship and serve other gods. So we kind of have this setup. He is clearly the bad guy there, right? The wicked, wicked king and his wife. And then here is Elijah, the prophet from God. And I want you to hear what happens in 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now this is a, this is a punishment on Ahab and on the nation. This is God bringing some of his divine uh, consequences against them because of their wickedness, because they've turned away from God. Elijah's being the voice of God to these people and saying, you know what, Here, here's how God's responding to your wickedness. Here's, some of the, here's, what, you're gonna, uh, here's what you've brought upon yourself. There's going to be this drought in the land for the next three years. Then look at verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook that I have ordered, and I have ordered ravens to feed you there. I'm going to just pause there and and help you see that this instruction that God's given to Elijah, this is probably the most difficult assignment he'd ever received. And, And there's lots of questions rolling through his mind right now, and perhaps some questions that you can relate with. And the first one might be this. Elijah, as he hears from God, Elijah hears this message, leave here and go and hide. And I have a feeling that the question running through Elijah's mind is, who, me? Who, me? Are you talking to me? You know? He's wondering, God, wait a second. I'm the good guy here. I'm the one that's doing what's right. And yet I'm the one that has to go and hide? Like, I would think that, that if God had some instruction, his instruction would be to Ahab to make Ahab be the one to uproot his family and his life and go and hide in a cave. 
But no, no, Elijah's the one that's getting the instruction. He's the one who's already serving God, and yet it's his life that's getting more complicated. And I have a feeling some of you may be able to relate with that. Right? Maybe in a, you're in a situation where you're the one who's, who's doing what's right. You're not the one at fault. And yet you kind of feel God's nudging in your heart. You need to go and kind of repair that relationship. And you're like, who, me? You know, it was him that did that. It was her that, that said that stuff. And you want me to go and offer forgiveness? You want me to go and offer grace? Who, me? And maybe God's inviting you to, to find a place to volunteer and to serve here at the church or in other... And who, me? God, do you realize how busy I am? you realize how many other things I got going on? Who, me? You want, you want me to do that? Maybe there, there's a situation for you, and, and God's inviting you to do something, and you really think he should be telling somebody else to do it. And this might be this question that Elijah's rolling around in his head is probably rolling around in yours as well. And so let's check out some other questions. God speaks to Elijah and says, Go and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. And now Elijah's thinking, Go where? Who, who me? And you want me to go where? You want me to go on which side of the Jordan? The, the east side of the Jordan. Now, this may not be that significant to you. Let me just give you a little glimpse into Old Testament history here. Oftentimes, when people are going east, it's just kind of, it's a strange thing in the Old Testament, but you can see it time and time again. It's, it's a sign that they're moving in the wrong direction. And obviously, I'm not, I have nothing, God has nothing against you know, the geography of it, but you do see this pattern over and over. When Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, they're sent to the east. Of the garden, And when the nations go and, and go to set up the Tower of Babel, which was really against what God wanted, they, do that, they go to the east and do that. And time and time again, you just see that, that heading to the east is, is almost uh, illustrative of moving away from what God wants. And specifically in this situation, the east of the Jordan, that's where, that's where they wandered in the wilderness. That's where the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. right? When they were delivered out of Egypt, when Moses delivered them, they go through the Red Sea. They wander in the wilderness on the east side of the Jordan River for 40 years. That was the place of, of punishment. That was the desert experience. And it was Joshua who leads them through the Jordan River, now to the west side, east side to the west side, right? He leads them to the west side. That's the promised land. That's where God's presence was. That was, as it was said, the land flowing with milk and honey. And so they never wanted to go back east. Right? They never wanted to go back to that place where we were far from God, that place where we were wandering away from God. And, and metaphorically and also very physically, the east side of the Jordan, you didn't want to be there. Right? That wasn't where the promised land was. And yet God's telling Elijah, you want me to go where? Go, go back to that place of desert, that place of barrenness. And specifically, I, I find it interesting that where God tells him to go is the Kareth Ravine. And in Hebrew, that word kareth, it, it comes from a word that, that means isolation, loneliness. It, it's a place that, that refers to having no provision, to having time on your own. It specifically, literally means to whittle down or to file down. The word kareth is that same idea of kind of sanding something down, getting rid of the rough edges and whittling it away, getting, getting it smaller and more precise. And this is exactly what God wants to do to Elijah is whittle him down and file him down, and he's going to send him to this place that seems far, that seems obscure, that seems distant and difficult. And some of you have asked God the same question. You want me to go where? Vilsack, Germany? What? You know, when you got those orders, some of you were probably thrilled, but others you were like, what? You know, you're coming from, like, Louisiana, or you're coming from some warm climates. You want me to go where? And the temperature's what? Some of you, God's asking you to go and, and, and build a relationship with people that may be far from him. And you're saying, you want me to go where? You want me to actually go and hang out with her or him? You want me to go to that place and be around those people? God, is that really what you're asking me? Who, me? Go where? Uh, he's got even more questions. God tells Elijah to leave here and hide. Hide in the Kareth Ravine of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook that I have ordered, and the ravens will feed you there. You want me to do what? <laughs> do what? 
drink from a brook. God, we just announced there's going to be a drought. Remember that? I mean, how are we going to drink from the brook when there's no rain? And, and I'm going to get my food from what? From the ravens? Seriously? I mean, some of you I know are dog lovers, right? Some of you, you got this thing going on with your canines. And your pastor and his wife, they're one of those. Like, they've got this thing outside their house where they list the members of the family, you know, Dwayne and Daylin and Seattle and Cypress. And they list the dogs right there, too. Like, they are part of the family. Ridley and Dover, they are just, they're part of the family. They let them sleep in my bed, you know? It's, they're tight. And I got no problem with that. I, we have a cat. We got some fish. I love pets. And, lo and some of you, you're tight with your animals. My mother-in-law's one. She, she shares her food with her animals. You know, lollipop there, lollipop for the dog. Some, I know a woman who cooks eggs for her dogs in the morning, you know? So I, you know, and dogs are one thing. But ravens? Like, have you ever seen ravens eat? You know what they eat? Like, anything dead and garbage and rotting carcasses. And, and that's what's going to be bringing food to me, Elijah's thinking? Like, you could have at least sent it, you know, with a dog or a clean animal. But the, these instructions make no sense. God, you want me to do what? And you've been there. Because God offers some instructions that don't make any sense. Right? To those of you that are, that are single and you see God's instructions for sex and, and, and for the purity that, that he wants us to, to withhold for marriage, and we're like, what? Like, God, that is just crazy. Like, have you, lived, have you noticed our world? You know, have you noticed how things work here in 2015? And we're like, God, you want me to do what? And you check out what Jesus is asking you to do. And you want me to give away how much of my hard-earned money? That doesn't make any sense, God. I barely have enough. And God's telling you to, to offer grace and love to your enemies. You're like, God, what in the world? That doesn't make any sense. And as you interact with Scripture and as you walk with God, if he hasn't already, he's going to ask you to do some things that just don't make any sense. And you're like, who, me? You want me to go where and do what? There's no way. And if that moment hasn't happened yet for you, you just haven't followed Jesus long enough because it's going to happen. It happened for Elijah. And this is such a critical moment for him because none of this makes sense. And we're in the same boat. Right? We felt that before. We felt that about God's direction. And so what do you do in that moment? What do you do when, when God's asking you to do stuff that just doesn't make any sense? What do you do when the instructions you receive are going to be hard and risky and just upend your life? Here's the answer. Listen carefully. It depends who's asking. It depends who's asking. Like, if I ask you to do stuff that's really hard and doesn't make any sense and it's going to turn your life upside down, don't even listen. <laughs> like, if it's just me, like, just say, that guy, he's from Scranton. All right, that's it. If it's me, if it's just your pastor, if it's just some friend, but, but if it's God that's asking you, well, you better pay attention, right? What do you do when the instructions don't make sense? That all depends on who's asking. It all depends on who's giving you the instructions. And, and I just want to have a little parenthesis here, because it's not specifically in, in Elijah's story, but I just want to give you some insight that was really helpful to me. It came from a book by Bill Hybels called uh, The Power of a Whisper. And, and Bill Hybels, who's been pastoring a church for probably 35, 40 years now, a church in Chicago, uh, writes about just hearing from God. And he uses the story of, of Samuel, the little boy who hears from God in the night, you know, and he wakes up and he thinks it's the priest. And he uses that as a springboard, and he takes us right through the scriptures about the fact that God does want to whisper to our hearts. God does want to speak to us through his word and through his spirit. And we need to be people who are learning how to hear that voice and listen to that voice. And so just a few questions to ask yourself. You know, if you're wondering, God, I kind of feel like here's what you're leaning, here's how you're leading, uh, is that you? And, and here are some questions that I've just found helpful. Is the idea or the direction of the instruction, is it coming from Scripture? Or, or is it at least in line with Scripture? And, you know, is that thing that you have this impression, you think you should be doing, is it, is it at least in line with what you see in Scripture? Is that going to be something that will help you love God and love others? Or is it something that's, that's kind of God's impressing on your heart as you're reading His Word, as you're interacting with Him? 
Right? Because God is never going to impress on your heart something that's contrary to his word. Now, that's not from God. That's, that's last night's Chinese food, you know, or just talking to you or something. Like, God's never going to impress you to do something that, that he's already been real specific about. And this one, you know, blows me away. I'll often counsel with couples who, you know, we just love each other so much, and we're not married, but we really just think God wants us to be happy, and so we're going to start living together. No, that isn't what God wants. He's very clear about that. And you can convince yourself really easily. I know I can too. You can convince yourself really easily that, that God wants what you really want. But, but God, the, the instruction, the prompting, the, the, the advice, the counsel that he gives us is always going to be in line with Scripture. And so that's always my first question. God, is this, is this at least in line with what I see in your word? Then I ask this question. Does this idea or this direction, does this instruction, does it keep coming up? Right? Have you ever had that? Where, where something comes to mind, you're like, wow, where did that come from? Like, make something right with so-and-so. And you haven't thought of so-and-so for ten years. You know, and all of a sudden that comes to mind, and you remember what is kind of in your past. And, and then, boy, you, you notice them on Facebook again. And then you, you all of a sudden, you know, get some mail that was sent to you and should have got, I don't know. But it just keeps coming up, right? This idea, this God just keeps bringing up, you, you need to make this right. There's some unfinished business here. There, there's a relationship that's broken that, that, that you could, you know, take a step towards making it right. And so if the, if the idea, if the instruction, if it's in line with Scripture... Then I, and then I keep moving forward. And then if it keeps showing up, you know, I start to realize, boy, maybe this is God speaking. And then I, then I ask this. I look back. As I look back, does this step seem like an appropriate next step? And this is big for me. I've seen God do this so many times where I kind of get this nudging to do something. And then I look back at my history, at my past experiences, and I say, wow, yeah, maybe this is what God had been preparing me for. You know, just a quick example for me, I never intended to be in global outreach. Right now, I'm, I'm, I oversee the global outreach for our church in Scranton, and, and I, I, never, I wanted to be a youth pastor. <laughs> and, and I started moving towards that, and then these other opportunities came up to, to be part of some things around the world and to, to lead teams to other countries and, and then to build these partnerships. And as I look back, I said, wait, I was born in Zimbabwe. You know, just north of South Africa. You wouldn't have guessed it, but I'm an Irish African American. Uh, and so I got that, and then I had family living all over Africa, living in England. Throughout high school and college, I was able to be a part of all kinds of, of global trips. And so I look back and I say, hey, you know what? That kind of makes sense. You know, I didn't realize it at the time, but this may very well be the next step God's preparing me for. And for me, that's a big confirmation. And you see that in Scripture as well, over and over, where God asks people to do something. And yes, it's a step of faith, but at the same time, he's been preparing them for this all along. And so pay attention to that in your life as well. right? The, the things that God's brought you to so far are, are going to help you take the next step that he's calling you to take. And then finally, this is an important question to ask. Do godly people affirm the wisdom of this move? Right? If you're about to do something, you really feel like God's prompting you to do this, well, well, then invite some godly people into that conversation with you. And say, hey, can you pray with me about this? Can you join me in this? I really feel like God's moving me in this direction. Can you uh, be with me as I go through this? Can you speak into that so I'm not blindsided? So what do you do when the instructions don't make any sense? It, it depends on who's asking depends on who's giving the instructions. And if those instructions are coming from God, through his word, through his spirit, through godly counsel, an appropriate next step that's in line with his scripture, well, then you better do exactly what Elijah did, which is in verse 5. After asking, who, me? Go where? Do what? Verse 5, Elijah did what the Lord had told him. It's that simple. Like, it didn't make any sense. It was going to upend his whole life. He was the good guy. Now he's going to this place to be whittled and filed down, to drink from a brook that's about to run dry, and eat from animals that are pretty disgusting. And yet, he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan River, and he stayed there. And check out what God did. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. 
He did what God asked him to do, and God showed up. And when you take that step, God's going to show up. I told you about Joshua leading the people through the Jordan River into, into this promised land. And if you look back at that story, you'll notice something so interesting, that that Jordan River didn't dry up until they got their feet wet. It wasn't until they stepped into the water, that step of obedience, and then God showed up and said, all right, I just was testing your faith. I was just seeing if you'd go through with it, and now I'm here. I'll take care of the rest. You see the same thing in the New Testament where Jesus invites those servants at the, at the wedding to fill up those buckets with water, right? Because they've run out of wine. And it's not till they fill them up, and it's clearly water, right? And he's just testing them to see if they'll obey some crazy instruction. And when they obey, God shows up and turns it into wine. Or how about when they're feeding 5,000 people, and all they've got is a little sack lunch. God doesn't multiply it until they start passing it out, until they start doing the stuff that makes no sense. But when we take that step, God shows up. And I promise you, he is not going to let you down. If God is inviting you to do that thing that makes no sense and is going to be really hard, and he wants you to go where and do what, if you do it, it's going to be one of those moments you look back on and say, you know what, God showed up. And now I'm ready to take another step with him. It's going to be one of those faith-building experiences that I want you to have. That's what it was for Elijah. It was a beautiful thing. And, and this, I just want to show you something from Elijah's story to give you a little glimpse of how cool it could be. I'm not saying it's going to be like this for you, but sometimes after we take that step, God even explains a little bit about why he asked us to do that crazy stuff. And, and if you, I read ahead in 1 Kings chapter 18, and I found this verse, and it was like, oh, see, that's why I had to go over to the east side. 1 Kings 18, verse 10 says this, as surely as the Lord your God lives, this is one of Elijah's servants is kind of repeating this back to him after he's safe. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there's not a nation or kingdom where my master, King Ahab, has not sent someone to look for you. But whenever a nation or a kingdom claimed that you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. So it's just this little glimpse we get later on from one of the servants of Ahab, and it gives Elijah this clue. Oh, see, that's why I had to go all the way over to the east side. Elijah didn't know it at the time, but Ahab sent servants everywhere on the west side of the Jordan looking to kill him. But they didn't even bother to look on the east side. And so Elijah gets this little glimpse like, Elijah, I know what I'm doing, God's saying to him. If you had stayed on the west side where you were comfortable, you'd have been dead. And so I know what I'm doing, even though I'm sending you to a crazy place. He gives him this little affirmation. You know what? I, I got it. And every now and then you'll get that from God as well. And it's a beautiful thing because you, you just get reminded, okay, all right, I see. I see why you did it that way now. Every now and then you get that, and it's real cool. I want to read you a quote from a, a book that I'd highly recommend. The book is called Radical. It's by David Platt. And he says this, God delights in using ordinary Christians who come to the end of themselves and choose to trust in his extraordinary provision. God stands ready to allocate his power to all who are radically dependent on him and radically devoted to making much of him. Right? If we're going to do what he asks us to do, then he's going to fill us with his power. If we're going to go where he wants us to go, then he's going to use us to spread his fame. When we take these steps of obedience, life becomes a thrill. Now, I wish, I really wish I could end here. I wish the story ended here. Because if the story ended here, then the motto could be, the moral of the story could be, okay, it's, just get ready, because at some time in your life, God's going to ask you to do this one crazy thing. He's going to ask you to take this one crazy step that doesn't make any sense. But if you do it, he'll show up. And then you can settle back in. Right? That would be a nice story. I mean, that, that'd be good, and we'd all get ready, and we'd be like, all right, I'm ready. Let's do my one thing, my one crazy move for God, and then I can get back to my life. Because right? so far, that's all it is for Elijah. But the story doesn't end here. Man, God wants more from Elijah. So we get to verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. 
I told you that would happen. <laughs> told you the brook was a bad idea, God. It's a drought, remember? We haven't had any rain in three years. And some of you have been here. You did the hard thing that God asked you to do. And the very thing you were afraid of is actually happening. I told you my kids would turn out this way, God. I told you she'd leave me. God, I told you it'd end this way. I told you that if I put myself out there, I'd get my heart broken. I told you that'd be a bad investment. God, I told you I never should have given money to them or there. And you have this moment with God where you're like, mm, you came through. I told you this would happen. And here's the moment where you have this critical decision to make. Are you going to turn against God and see, God, I'm on my own now. I can't rely on you. And you turn away from him in those moments, or do you continue, as hard as it is, to lean into him in those moments? That's verse 8. We read this. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Now, I've got to say that verse 8 and verse 9 here, this is one of those good news, bad news kind of situations. Right, you're probably familiar with that. Like the doctor that says, you know what, I've got good news and bad news for you. The, the good news is that, uh, you know, you've got about 48 hours to live. And you're like, what? That's the good news? And he's like, yeah, because the bad news is I couldn't get a hold of you yesterday. <laughs> Come on, all right. Some of you will get that in a little bit, all right? But this is one of those moments because the good news is that, you know what, God is still with him. God is still speaking to him. The brook dries up, and Elijah's not on his own. God is still there. But the bad news is, God's given him another assignment that doesn't make any sense. Right? It's one of those moments where, God, I don't know if I want to listen to you again, because listening to you is what got me into this situation. But God is still there. Even when the brook dries up, you're not there alone. God is still there, and he's still speaking and he gives this instruction to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon. Stay there. I've commanded a widow to supply for you. And once again, what's Elijah asking? Go where? You want me to go where? To Zarephath in Sidon? Like if you thought going to the east side of the Jordan was bad, this is even worse. Do you remember who the, the, Elijah's biggest enemy at this point is? Is who? It's Ahab and his wife. Jezebel. You know where Jezebel is from? Like her hometown, like the place where she was like homecoming queen. She's like the most popular girl. Yeah, it comes in Kings 18, verse 31. Ahab not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And together they began to worship and serve Baal. So, like, this is her hometown. Her dad's the king of Sidon. And, and, and she wants Elijah dead, and I'm sure her dad does too. You want me to go there? Like, right into the heart of it. Right into the danger zone. Right into the, most, you know, the hot spot. And Elijah's thinking, this doesn't make sense. God, of all the places I could hide out, this is probably the worst Zarephath, by the way, some of you like these little nuggets from the ancient text. Zarephath means crucible. If you know what a crucible is, it, I don't have any experience with it, but from what I understand, it's, it's a place where you, you melt down gold and precious metals so that all the impurities come out and you have something even, even more beautiful and more valuable. But it's a very delicate process. It's a process, intense heat. And, and that's what Zarephath means. And so here's Elijah being sent first to, to, uh, to the place that means to whittle down or to file down. He's sent to Kareth. And then after he's filed down and sanded down, now he's sent to the crucible, right, where things are going to get even hotter so that God can melt down and melt away all the impurities and bring out something that's even more beautiful and more valuable. But the process, it's not pretty and it's not fun. And yet these are the places that God sends us but he goes there with us. And we keep asking, you want me to go where? It doesn't make any sense that I should be the one going there. And yet if we go, we'll find that God's there with us and he's doing something within us. 
And then Elijah's asking this question, with whom? It's a little harder to roll that one off the tongue, but with whom? You want me to go, who me, go where, with whom? With a widow? Like if you could list all the people that you would like to, to take care of you while you're like a fugitive on the run, you'd probably wish for like a, a rich landowner, right? Or, or someone who owns their own business and has lots of you know, extra room and cash lying around. And I have the utmost respect for single moms, but they'd be the first to tell you that sometimes it's all they can do just to care for themselves and their kids, right? They're not exactly the ones that are inviting fugitives in to take care of them as well, right? This is not an easy situation for Elijah to put himself in. You want me to depend on who? Like this, this woman's a widow and she has a child, right? It's all she can do to care for herself. And now I'm going to go make myself dependent on her as well. God, this doesn't make any sense. None of God's instructions seem to make sense. And yet, Elijah is convinced that these instructions are coming from God himself. And so look at verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. He did what God asked him to do. He didn't stop short. He didn't go anywhere else. He didn't try to find someone else to take care of him. He did exactly what God asked him to do. And, and especially when we tag this together with, with the last idea, right? The fact that, that initially he went to the Kareth Ravine, and now he goes to this widow in Zarephath. We begin to see a pattern, and it's the pattern that God wants to see from every one of us. It's a pattern that we've even mentioned a few times this weekend. God's inviting us not just to, to stay still, and not just to take a step with him, but to walk with him. And by its very definition, walking demands one step after another, after another. And this one doesn't make much sense. And the next one might not either. And the one after that may be even harder. But God's inviting us not to run ahead of him and take care of everything ourselves. Not to stay still and just hunker down till he comes back. Not to just take one step of bold, audacious faith but to walk by faith, day by day by day. And if you remember nothing else from our time together today, remember this. Listen to God and do what he says. Listen to God and do what he says. If that became the pattern of our lives, we would be living some radical lives of adventure and obedience and danger, but God's presence is with us, and day by day we're walking with him. Listen to God and do what he says. It's going to be hard. It's going to be risky. It won't make sense, but the God of the universe will be there with you. What else do you need? And you're asking, who, me? Go where and do what? With whom? God, none of what you're asking me makes sense, but I'll do it. If you promise to go with me, I'll do it. Now, you could probably give examples of this from your life. There are times, I've, I've touched on a couple of times in my life where I've seen examples of this. I want to just read you one example. And so bear with me, the story is maybe a page or two long. But just a neat story of how God shows up and, and invites us to do something that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then we see how his hand is in it. And, and maybe this is similar to the kind of thing God's asking you to do. Maybe the kind of thing God's asking you to do is very different. But, but I think the principle is still the same. This comes from a book called The Unexpected Adventure, which is all about what happens when we live a life in crazy obedience to God, and specifically telling other people how they can have a relationship with God. And this is what the author says. One average and routine day, I was packing up my briefcase and getting ready to leave the newspaper where I, where I worked when I felt this gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit. I sensed that God wanted me to go to the business office and invite my friend, who was an atheist, to come to Easter services at my church. Since the impression seemed so strong, I figured that something dramatic was going to happen. And it did, but not in the way that I had anticipated. I walked into the business office, I looked around, the place appeared empty except for my friend who was sitting at his desk. Perfect. I reminded him that Easter was coming up and I asked him if he would want to come to church with me. He turned me down flat. 
I asked him if he was interested at all in spiritual matters, and he emphatically said no. I talked to him about why the resurrection was so important, but he clearly was not interested. With all of my evangelistic overtures being instantly shut down, I was beginning to get a little embarrassed. Why was he so disinterested in talking about spiritual matters if God was indeed prodding me to talk with him? Finally, I just stammered, Well, uh, if you ever have any questions, uh, I guess you know where my desk is. And I walked out. What was that about, God? I couldn't understand why he was so adamantly resistant. Not God, but his friend. In the end, I concluded that maybe I was going to be one link in a very long chain of people and experiences that would eventually lead him to Christ. Still, as far as I know, he remains a skeptic to this day. Now, fast forward several years. By this time, I was a teaching pastor at Willow Creek Community Church in the suburbs of Chicago. After I spoke one Sunday morning, a middle-aged man came up to me and shook my hand and said, I just want to thank you for the spiritual influence you've had in my life. Well, that's very nice, I said, but who are you? Let me tell you my story. A few years ago, I lost my job. I didn't have any money, and I was afraid I was going to lose my house. I called a friend of mine who runs a newspaper, and I said, do you have any work for me? He said, can you tile floors? Well, I had tiled my bathroom once, so I said, of course I can. <laughs> he told me, we need some tiling done down at the newspaper. If you can do that, we can pay you. So one day, not long before Easter, I was on my hands and knees behind the desk in the business office of the newspaper, fixing some tiles. You walked into the room. I don't think you even saw me. You didn't even know I was there. You started talking about God and Jesus and Easter to some guy behind the desk. He wasn't interested at all. But there I was, crouching there behind the desk, listening. My heart is beating out of my chest, and I start thinking to myself, I need God. I need Jesus. I need to go to church on Easter. As soon as you left, I called my wife, and I said, we're going to church this Easter. She said, are you kidding? I said, no, we are. We ended up coming to this church that Easter. My wife, my teenage son, and I gave our lives to Christ. I just wanted to thank you. I was dumbstruck. Who else could have orchestrated that except our amazing God of grace? The instructions didn't make any sense at all. And he didn't see the outcome for years, and it wasn't at all what he was expecting. But he listened to God, and he did what he said, and he left the results to God, and amazing things begin to happen. And I have no doubt that at one point in your life, you're going to be able to look back at those same kind of stories. You may not see right away why God sent you here and has you interacting with him or befriending her or repairing that relationship or going there or doing this. You may not know, but if you continue to live that life of radical obedience, one day you'll look back and see the beauty that God's orchestrating if you listen to God and do what he says. We look back at Elijah, and we read this. He did what the Lord had told him. Oh, that that could be said of us. right? What, what is it that's going to be said of you when the chapter of your life is being written? What will God say of you? Right? He knew what God wanted him to do, but he found a way to do something else. She knew the step God wanted her to take, but she just thought it was too hard. She got distracted. They knew what God wanted them to give, but they kept it for themselves instead. He knew how God wanted him to live, but he decided to live for himself instead. I don't want that story to be written about you or about me. If it could be said of us, he did what God asked him to do, that would be a good life. Do what God asks you to do. It may not make sense. It's going to be really hard, but it's going to be so worth it when you listen to God and do what he says. Let me just close with one more quote from the book Radical. He ends with this. He says, My biggest fear, even now, is that I will hear Jesus' words and I will walk away content to settle for less than radical obedience to him. In other words, my biggest fear is that I will do exactly what most people did when they encountered Jesus in the first century. Of all the people Jesus called and spoke to and invited, only 12 actually lived lives of radical obedience. 
and they changed the world. And think about what all the others missed out on. Think about what the thousands of others who were invited to follow Jesus and give their whole lives to him, think of what they could have been a part of. And that's what you and I have the chance to be a part of. Our God is at work, not just here, but everywhere. And he's sending us out to go where he's leading and to join what he is doing. And I have no idea what he wants you to be a part of, but it's going to be great. So listen to him and do what he says. God, we just lay our lives before you. And even if it's just in this moment right now, God, we want to offer ourselves in complete surrender to you. And we're just going to tell you right now, whatever you ask, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to make that commitment right now. God, if we know that that instruction is coming from you, we'll just say our yes ahead of time. Because it's going to be hard. It's not going to make sense. It's going to cost more than we have. But God, we're going to say yes. If it's coming from you, we're going to do it. We are going to be the people, the community of believers, that's going to follow you in radical obedience. And we're just going to wait with bated breath to see what you do with our small lives. And oh, that it would be said of us, they did what the Lord asked them to do. May that be said of the people of High Point Baptist Church in Vilsack. In your name we pray. Amen.